Hi everyone, so obviously we're on episode three of my journey now. Um, I am in my bedroom again. I've got really bad backache, so I decided, you know what, I'm going to stay in my jammies and just sit on my bed and do this, just because this is this is what my life entails, so there's no point trying to fake it and make my life look glamorous when it really, really isn't. So um, I'm here with a lemon and ginger tea because I've been feeling sick. Um, yeah, so just crack on with episode number three, really. So, um, I thought I would talk about interstitial cystitis in more greater detail this time, because usually, you know, the past two I've done my journey and then I've spoke about something that someone's asked me about. So I thought, you know, let's talk about the symptoms and the medications that I take um, and really, so someone might look at this and go, right, okay, I think that might be me, because I've gone into it a bit more details, so, which is what I want, you know, I do believe that there are a lot more people out there with interstitial cystitis than people think, um, they just don't know the symptoms, and the GPs just don't know what interstitial cystitis is, because the research isn't there, so I don't think it really is a rare condition, I just think it's a condition that really hasn't got much knowledge about it at all which is a shame because if you're suffering with these symptoms it's not, it's not nice to live with so if you can at least try and get treatment that's going to help your symptoms then kind of great so I really do want to stress though that you don't have to have every single symptom to have the condition I find that I've been to GPs and they've gone, well, you've only got seven out of the eight symptoms, so you've not got it. You don't have to have eight out of eight or, you know, just uh, it doesn't have to be that way. And it really does something that really annoys me because why should you be dismissed just because you don't have every single symptom? You know, yeah, one out of eight, okay, you've probably not got it. But if you've got like six or seven out of those eight symptoms, then you've probably got a good chance of having it. You don't need to have every single one. And it could be that that eight symptom just isn't, is there, but isn't that bad. So you haven't really thought about it. And so you've not discussed that to anyone. So um, obviously as I discussed in my first episode, was um, that I started to get symptoms when I was 14. Um, so I'd have really bad belly ache, um, particularly in the evenings. Um, it would majorly be in the evenings. And I'd feel really, I'd just feel really, I'd feel really sick. I'd have really bad belly ache. Um, it wouldn't be in a specific area, it would be generalised around my tummy. Um, and I just remember it really, really hurting. And it would always be, you know, like I said, predominantly in the evenings. Um, and it was... I'd, well, I'd wake up in the mornings and it would kind of be, be almost gone. And then I'd get home from school and it would start to come on. And I'd in the evenings, it would just be really, really bad. So obviously I kept going to the doctors and stuff and being dismissed and you've not, you've not got anything wrong. It's, you know, you're putting it on. And that, that kind of went round and round in circles. Um, I would say that my main symptoms probably didn't start until... Um, maybe when I started my photography course at college, so that was after I'd had Oscar. So I had my symptoms before I had Oscar, um, and when I fell pregnant with him, it was in the April, April of 2011. Um, and I didn't really think about it because my symptoms weren't super bad. So I didn't really think to myself, oh, they've, they've kind of disappeared. I didn't. It didn't, it, as strange as that sounds. So even though I only had a lot of symptoms in the evenings, it just didn't really resonate in my mind that anything had changed. Um, it wasn't until I had Oscar, which was in January of 2012, uh, a few weeks later, I started to get these pains back. And I was like, hmm, I remember these. And I remember going up to my mum and going, you know them pains I used to get? They've come back. Like, 
I didn't have them the whole pregnancy, so it was really, really bizarre. So, obviously, I was thinking, this is a gynae problem. This has got to be a gynae problem. It can't be... It can't be anything else, you know. It's got to be... If, if they've gone while I've had Oscar, then that's kind of... You know, that was my... The way my trainer thought, the way that, that I thought about it. So I went back to the doctors and just kept getting dismissed and going back to gynae and being misdiagnosed with stuff. And as you know, that just kind of went round and round. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started college and I used to have to miss days because I felt so poorly. Um, very similar symptoms, but my pain was then starting to come through the day wasn't just at night time, it was through the day as well, but it wasn't to the point where it really stopped me from doing anything. You know, I managed to complete college um, and I got a distinction, distinction merit. So I did do really well. Um, and I was really proud of myself actually, you know, having a son that was in, in nursery. Um, he was only six months old when I started. So he was like two, three when I finished and the pain then started to get worse once I went to university. Um, but I went to university in London, so I would get the train from Kings Lynn to London every day. So Kings Lynn train station to Kings Cross and then the underground to Elephant and Castle to uh, London College Communication. And I'd do this journey, you know, between anywhere between three to five days a week. Um, and I'd find that a lot a lot of my symptoms were getting worse around that time. So I would have it so bad through the night that I wouldn't sleep. So then I'd be awake all night. So the last thing I wanted to do was to go to go to uni because I was absolutely shattered. I didn't want to go all that way. Um, the pain would be quite, quite severe. Um, still the same symptoms really, just so much pain like really really bad pain um it would hurt so badly to the point where i'd have to go go to hospital um because it would be so bad um as uni went through it it was getting worse but i didn't really notice there were certain things that were happening, but I didn't think, oh, that's anything to do with what's wrong with me. Like, I started to need the toilet more, and if I needed a wee, I would get really bad belly ache, and if I left it too long, that that's when the pain would get worse. But I didn't really think anything of it, because in my head, it was gynae, so why would anything to do with my bladder and go into the toilet? Why would that affect anything, really? I didn't think that would, so... Um, I finished, finished, um, university and it was in, so what we in now, 2020, so mid 2019, beginning of 2019 to the middle of 2019, started to get a lot of UTIs. So this is where my symptoms were getting really, really bad and these are the symptoms that I would say for people to look out for um for maybe that they would have in stitch or cystitis so i started to get utis but sometimes i would go and they would say it would they would dip test it and it would say it had um an infection and other times it wouldn't but i would have the same symptoms every single time so obviously i would go to the doctors with the same symptoms and sometimes there would be a uti sometimes they wouldn't and it was just like what what is going on um, some samples would get sent off and they would come back that they were absolutely normal when in the doctor's surgery it said that I had an infection. So I'd get a phone calls saying, right, you need to stop your antibiotics because you haven't actually got one. Um, it wasn't until I went to the doctors and I saw this particular nurse and he was like, you've had quite a few UTIs in the past six months. Um, you know, is this normal for you? And I said, well, no. It's only been the, six, the past six months where... The UTIs have got worse, you know. I must have had a few... I did have a few UTIs going back to the age of 14, you know, a few. But nothing to the point where they were so consistent and so close together. And the symptoms would be 
so so bad so he said i'm going to refer you to guy uh not gynae sorry i'm going to refer you to urology so i was referred to um someone called um i was referred to dr illy first but he dismissed me so then i was to mr eaton and this is where things kind of come to light and i was like okay so the first time i ever saw him he was brilliant he said to me you know what are your symptoms and i'd say i think i've got utis all the time um my i i constantly feel like i need a wee so i'm going to the toilet you know between 20 and 40 times a day and sometimes i like nothing's coming out it stings when i go to the toilet i get really bad belly ache um i get the urgency so i as soon as i need the toilet i have to go straight away um you know i've got all of the symptoms of a uti um but it doesn't always show um so he said right well there is a condition where because you've got the implant your hormones are kind of up and down all over the place they're not really consistent and because i didn't have a proper period and i hadn't i haven't had a proper period since i've had oscar in you know january 2012 nothing's ever been consistent in that department it can then affect the hormone imbalance can affect something that's within the bladder you know i'm i'm no doctor i'm no urogyne i don't really know the like specifics of it but to me he just said you know your hormones are affecting something that are in your bladder. There's these cells and they start to turn. And then they give you the symptoms that you've got a UTI. Every single symptom, they give you that. You haven't actually got one, but they trick your bladder into thinking you have got one. So he said, what we'll do is we'll do a cystoscopy. We'll have a look inside while you're awake and then go from there. So things were starting to get a little bit worse. Um, a couple of weeks later, I had my cystoscopy. And he said, um, we found some cells, your blood is red, so we're going to book you in for surgery. So the surgery that I was going in for was to have um, some cells burnt away. So the cells that he thought that were there were the ones that were making me think that I had a UTI. He was going to burn them away. And he said, once, they've, once I've burnt them away, you will, you know, your symptoms are going to go. You're going to be back to normal. So I was hopeful, thinking like oh my god finally finally i have an answer and finally i'm going to be pain free you know i was taking 3500 cocodamol for for like every 4 hours since the age of you know 14 15 i do take it still now but i was thinking i haven't got to take this medication anymore great it's going to go so i went to have this operation and woke up come round and mr eaton come to see me he literally saw me for a couple of seconds because he was running late and he just said we found some odd cells it wasn't what we thought um but we've done a biopsy and we've just got to wait to see what it comes back so i was obviously panicking what biopsy cancer that's the first thing that comes to my head but then I also thought, well, it can't be cancer because if it was cancer, then surely I wouldn't be here now. As <laughs> like as dramatic as that sounds, like I'd suffered with this pain for so long that I just didn't think that that was the reason. But obviously, it was still in the back of my head. Um, I was sent home, obviously, with discharge notes, and I managed to read interstitial cystitis. So I, I obviously looked that up, and I was like, wow, that's me. But I was reading the symptoms and I was like, mm, I don't really want this because it's incurable. Mum was like, well, you probably haven't got that. You know, if it's something that's that bad, no, you can't have that. Um, But obviously I was still worrying and I went to back to see Mr. Eaton and he was like, I'm really, really sorry that I've got to tell you this, but you've got interstitial cystitis it's not something that i want to tell a young girl and we're going to start installations so once i'd had that surgery where i was put to sleep and had the cystoscopy and the biopsies taken my health in general has gone downhill quite quite a lot so i would 
I didn't have a catheter then. So we're talking normal symptoms for everybody else. Ignore the catheter part. So I was going to the toilet all the time. Constantly. I just have to sometimes I just think, you know, I'm just going to stay here. Because I felt like I really needed a wee. And nothing was coming out. But it felt so badly that I needed one that I was scared to get off. Um, if I went to the shops, I'd have to run. Run to a toilet and be like, please let me use the toilet. I've got to go. Um... I'd wet myself because I'd need a wee so badly and the pain would be so bad that the easiest thing would... I'd have to relieve myself, you know. As as horrible as that sounds, as hard, hard to admit that that's what was happening, it was. You know, the pain... I, I can't explain the pain. Um, you know, I have shared a photo before that explains how bad... The pain is which i'll probably use as the photo for like the beginning of this video and it says that it's the same pain as someone who has got who is having like kidney dialysis or um has got cancer and i don't like to put myself in the same category as someone's got that got has got cancer obviously but just as and for you to understand how bad the pain can be that's what scientists and you know um people gps and consultants have kind of research has has put it down to and that's how bad it is um and it would just be so bad and i'd have the just the urgency that i'd be in bed and i put oh i need a toilet i'd wake up i'd say probably about 10 times a night to go for a wee so my sleep was so disruptive. I was just constantly running back to the toilet. And I think that's one of the hardest things is hardly getting any sleep because you're constantly waking up to go to the toilet. And then you go to the toilet. Well, by the time you've gone down those stairs and back up again, your body's like starting to wake up. So then you're awake for about half an hour before you can even manage to get back to sleep. By the time you got back to sleep, your body's telling you you need a wee again. So it's the same cycle. So then going to work is just difficult because you've got absolutely, you know, you are knackered. So your coordination is rubbish. You know, you've all of these things that you need to function with every day is just being thrown straight out the window because you can't, you can't do it. So I would say urgency, frequency and urgency are the two massive, massive ones. You know, when you've got a UTI and you feel like you need a wee all the time and like you constantly go in and a little bit's coming out this is all the time every day 24 7 you know if you've got that and you're going to the doctors and they're saying it's not a uti then it i'm not saying you've got that but it's very very much likely that maybe you could and it would be a good idea to maybe go go to the doctor if you think that you're going to the toilet all the time um and if i didn't go like i've said so many times the pain would be unbearable you know going for a trip anywhere in the car i'd just think oh, no what if i need a wee i'd have to stop off sometimes i have to go squat <laughs> it would be degrading it's horrible and you'd have to try and hide because you don't want people to know that you're squatting but i had no other choice because the pain was so bad and being on a plane if you're going for on holiday and you're sitting on a plane, you're thinking, well, what? what? Like, I, I had to keep getting in and out get over people. And they're probably thinking, for God's sake, she's getting up again. Like, why is she going to the toilet again? But I just need it all the time. Um, and I started to get backache, which I have got a bulging disc in my lower back. Um, so I, I obviously do get back pain from that. But I get quite a lot of back pain from my interstitial cystitis as well. Um... And it is quite bad. I don't think this is in everyone, but it is in quite a few people, kind of this ache ache in the back that just kind of doesn't go. Um, and to help with these, all of these symptoms, like I said, I was told to have these installations. So I'd go to the hospital once a week and have them done. So I had my first one. And do you know what? It worked perfectly. I had, 
I'm not saying for that whole week I was pain free because I wasn't, but I had one day where I was pain free and I've never had that since the age of 14. And it was like magic potion. I was, what the hell is this? This is fantastic. Like I'll keep having these done and I'm going to be fine. So I went back for my second installation. That one just made me really poorly. So when I went for my third, um, Mr. Eaton said to me, we're not going to do this because you're too ill. You know, let's, let's start again next week. But the thing is, you're then disrupting the cycle. So then, because I didn't go, that was then starting back to for number one. So I went back for that one, the fourth one. And that one made me so poorly again. Um, by the time I'd gone to, for my fourth, I this is when I had gone into retention. And I don't know why, I just, one day, I just couldn't go to the toilet. So I had to go to obviously A&E and I put a catheter in. And a week later, I had the catheter taken out. But I was still having the installations while I had a catheter. But it was just making me worse. Um, they said that, you know, it doesn't work for everyone. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Other times people get adverse reactions, which obviously what I was getting, it was just hurting me. So I stopped having the installations. Um, myself and the nurse who'd done them made the decision that having the installation just didn't benefit me if anything it was doing the complete opposite and it was a it was a waste of time going for something that was making me lay in bed for days um but these installations do help a lot of ladies because they cover um you they if you haven't got a catheter they put a catheter inside and they put this a potion of uh, different medicines into your bladder and you need to hold it for as long as you can you know hold it hold it hold it and then you let like obviously go for a wee so they say for a couple of hours don't go to the toilet which obviously some of institutional status this is really hard um but I was quite good I managed to hold it and it would give your bladder a lining and a protective layer as such um to then obviously when your urine is going into your bladder it's not causing you as many symptoms and that's basically what it's meant to do um but for some reason it just wasn't working for me so i stopped i stopped mine um and this is when obviously i've i've just carried on having a catheter but i think i'm i think i've probably got a condition called Fowler's syndrome as well as interstitial cystitis and Fowler's syndrome is where there's a certain muscle in your bladder that makes it stops working so you can't go for a wee which is what causes the retention um you have to have a special test for this and with things happening in the world right now um, it's taken a very long time for me to be able to have this test done but i do believe that's what i've got i don't think my retention is down to interstitial cystitis at all it isn't a symptom it isn't something that does happen so i don't believe that that is what it is. Um, I've recently been, well, actually a couple of days ago, finally got diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is why I hurt all the time, I'm so tired. Um, but that's for another day. Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to explain how I've gone with institutional status and my symptoms. So yeah, it's it's mainly the frequency, the urgency um the stinging you get a heavy feeling in your urethra so right at the tip of where you the wee comes out that will like throb and burn and just really really hurt that's quite a common symptom too um i could feel that i had something constantly stuck in my urethra like a stick and that it was always there but obviously i had nothing there so that was something else um like I said, yeah, the pain in the tummy. But once I then realised that my condition and my pain was to do with my bladder, I then started to localise the pain. So then, whereas before it was all over, I still get the pain all over, but I can tell when I've got a belly ache and when I've got an interstitial status flare-up. It's kind of like a throbbing pain in the bladder and it, it, it throbs. And I could feel, like, my bladder pulsating, and which is, causes my back pain, and it's just... Those two and two together is just something that is just, yeah, it's just so horrible. Um, Obviously, getting up to go to the toilet so many times in the night, so then you get restless sleep. Um, With that, makes your immune system really low, so then you're catching all these other bugs. Um, But they are my symptoms, you know, 
there could be more and there well there are more um so if you if you've kind of got an inkling that this is what you could have then you know look on look on um the internet because they're on the nhs website and other websites there's um and blood health uk actually it tells you the symptoms um in more depth you know i'm just telling my story i don't want to falsify it anyone i just want to tell you what i go through you know i'm not a doctor i'm not a consultant i'm nothing like that i'm just sharing my experience um you know institutional status has taken over my life i now can't work um i am classed as disabled you know i do have a blue badge because i can't get in and out of my car properly um you know it has changed my life a lot um and i don't know what happened with that operation that i had in november last year but whatever it was that happened has just made my health go downhill um and it's affected my mental health badly. Um, I will talk about incestual cystitis and mental health together in another video because it's so, so important. Um, and it's something that I feel that I really do need to talk about. But yeah, those are kind of my my symptoms. And that's what I wanted to talk about on this episode. Um, because obviously, what's the point in talking about my journey and my incestual cystitis if I'm not going into detail about my symptoms and where they've kind of hap like gone to um i do take a lot of medication so i take cocodamol to help with the pain 3500 um i'm also on pregabalin i'm on quite a high dosage of that um buscapan which is quite good that helps like bladder spasms um i'm on a few others as well antihistamines surprisingly antihistamines are brilliant i do my pain kind of has gone down slightly by taking antihistamines and I do swear by them, you know. I think antihistamines are so good with interstitial cystitis, for me personally anyway, and I think it's something that someone else should try 100%. Give, give antihistamines a good go. Some people have them from over the counter, but I have got one from my GP, which is a, a, a stronger stronger dosage which is what i have but certainly you can try the ones over the counter you know the hay fever loratadine ones um i've just started taking morphine patches um now because my pain is just so severe but you know i never thought i actually got asked the other day did you think that you was going to get diagnosed with the blood condition no I really didn't. I believed it was gynae all the time. I, If I ever saw a urologist, I really thought they were wasting their time, they were wasting my time. And I never in a million years thought it was going to be a urology problem at all. But obviously it is. And now I can try and move forward and have certain things done to help try and relieve my symptoms. Obviously things aren't working for me because I was left for so long. But I'm hope I'm 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 hopeful and I'm starting to change my perspective on my life. Um there's I know there's people out there who are so much worse than I am. There are and I'm very lucky for the life that I have and I am very lucky for the family that I have and the situation that I'm in. Um and I've realized that I need to start looking at the positives rather than keep looking at the negatives because if you've got a negative mindset, it just makes you worse. It really, really does. It makes everything else worse. It makes all your symptoms worse. You need to try and be positive. And that's where... I'm not saying I am completely, because I'm really not. Um, One small step I've made is I have downloaded a meditation app, which I think that that's going to help me. I haven't done any yet, but that small step of taking that and downloading that, just so it's there, I keep looking at it to do it, I just haven't got around to starting it yet, but, you know, I'm going to start trying to be more positive, so I'm going to wrap this up, because it's getting to 30 minutes, um, and I don't want to bore you, I've, I've probably completely bored you by now, you know, you're probably thinking, shut up, this has gone on for too long, so I am going to, I'm going to wrap this up now, but look forward to seeing people's comments, you know, I'm getting quite quite a few views on this and people liking it and more subscribers. But come on, comment. I'd like people to 
ask me questions and so I can do other videos of what you would like to know. So yeah, please, 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 you know, go on to even Instagram and ask me a question so I know what, what to speak about or on here, comment below, um, s subscribe, please subscribe. So yeah, um, I'm going to go. Happy Sunday. Hope you have a lovely roast dinner. No gravy if you've got interstitial status because that does play you up. No gravy. Um, but yeah, have a happy Sunday and love to you all. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, I appreciate it so, so much. But yeah, bye-bye.